Dr. Jin, you have been fighting for the preservation of nature and against the climate change for a long time. Has the situation improved along those years? It's gradually got worse. Uh, the thing that's improved is awareness among people. People are aware of what's happening. And so many people feel it's hopeless and therefore they do nothing because what's the point? That's the problem. What do you think is the importance of having a young and mediatic environmental leaders such as Greta Thunberg, for example? So it depends uh, on the attitude of the young people. And personally, you know, from my perspective, if I'm talking to a higher person in government or something, I, I try not to be aggressive. Right. I try not to point a finger. Because I know perfectly well if I do, they'll be in their mind thinking, well, how can I refute this? And I don't want to be talked to like that. So my way is different. My way is getting a feel for the person and then trying to find a story because I think you have to reach the heart. And it's change from within that is real change. Whereas lip service, because it seems the thing to do, oh, yes, I'll agree with this and I'll agree I'm a bad person, but I don't mm -hmm. really think it and I'm not going to change the way I behave. That's my experience. Um, you're a pioneer in studying the chimpanzees. And what have you learned from them that help you understand human beings better? Well, what I've learned from them is how like us they are. And, you know, in their nonverbal communication, kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting one another, males swaggering, competing <laughs> for dominance, just like human male politicians. And so what I've learned is that the main difference is the fact we've developed this spoken language so that we can teach our children about things that are not present. So chimpanzee youngsters learn, but they learn by watching and imitating and practicing and through experience, whereas our children can be taught. And perhaps most important of all, we can bring people together to discuss a certain situation. And we can then use this highly developed brain, which I believe is the result of being able to speak words. Um, then we can bring people together from different disciplines, different walks of life to try and solve problems. Dr. Jin, what comes to mind to your mind when you think about the Amazon? Uh, what can Brazil do to preserve the rainforest better? Well, <laughs> the deforestation, the cattle ranching, the destruction of huge areas to grow soy and so on, uh, the gold mining, all of these things are, I, I couldn't say how rapidly, but the little bit I've seen is shocking. And, it, you know, it's one of the really rich, rich areas of biodiversity that can help to reduce climate change, but not if it's destroyed. So, that, you know, I'm more familiar with the Congo Basin. Right. But the Congo Basin and the Amazon Basin are the two great areas which we should be protecting with the trees and vegetation absorbing carbon dioxide and, you know, the rich biodiversity. In the last years, uh, the planet has been facing another threat, negationism from politicians. What can uh, we do to save the world from them? Well, I think... Um, it's, That's a hard one. It, it's a question of the voting public right. having the information and determining that they want a different kind of, of, of way of being governed. And the problem is, I've noticed it again and again, um, a young politician gets his job and he's really, you know, I'm going to defend the environment, I'm going to fight climate change. And then he introduces a policy which the voters, maybe they have to tighten their belt one notch because uh, it might cost a penny more, and then they turn away. And this is the problem. So we, it must be the people supporting the right people in government and the right people in politics. And that's why I'm working on the Jane Goodall Institute Youth Program Roots and Shoots. You never thought about working in politics uh, yourself, just through the Institute? No way. No way. No way. <laughs> Talk to politicians, yes. Um, but to be a politician, 
No. Never. Chimpanzees, okay. Politicians, no. <laughs> chimpanzees, jaguars, howler monkeys, any of the animals. You know, it just happened to be chimpanzees. I didn't choose them. My mentor, Louis Leakey, wanted right. someone to study them because they're 98.6% of their DNA structure is the same as ours. And then you fall in love with the subject and dedicated your life to it. Well, they are so like us. They're really fascinating. Their politics, fascinating. And, you know, the Gombe research, which I began in 1960, is now in its 60, approaching 64th year. Non-stop, same individuals. So one generation to the next to the next. Just, I think, the first baby has been born in the fifth generation. And what do you, what do you feel when you see them? You know, the first ones that you met and... Well, sadly, the first ones I met are gone. Right. They, they can live to be 60. Right. But, you know, the ones I knew really, really well are all gone. There's one female who I first knew when she was, I think, five, six years old. And she's a very old lady, but she had a baby two years ago. She's strong and she's dominant women. So, in, in your book of hope, you say we live in dark times. Uh, what can the average citizen do to help uh, uh, bring some light into the world? The average citizen. Well, I think it depends. You know, people are very different. Right. People have different jobs. People uh, different uh, economic levels. But everybody can do something. Everybody can make a difference every single day. That's the main message of our youth program. And our youth program, by the way, is is kindergarten, university, and even beyond. And its main message is every individual makes some impact every day, and we get to choose what sort of impact we make. And so everybody can choose to do something to, um, to help climate change. For example, they can choose what to buy and what not to buy. True. They can choose what to eat and what not to eat. And one really important thing is moving towards plant-based diet because of the huge areas, not just here in Brazil, but, you know, everywhere, um, land given over to raising cattle. And, sure. of course, also uh, in some countries, breeding of pigs is huge. And the, the pig manure is, you know, harming the environment, washed into the rivers. And that of the cows, too. In Amazon, that's a big problem in Amazon yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, some people think that hope is, is a passive feeling. Do you think hope needs action to succeed? Absolutely. Right. Hope is about taking action. So, you know, people come to me and they're very depressed. And they say, well, you know, it's obviously too late. Um, we... we reach a point of no return with our destruction of the environment, climate change, loss of biodiversity. And they're just terribly, terribly depressed. So I say, well, if you think about what's happening around the world, then of course you're going to be depressed. Everybody, I mean, I am, if you think about all these problems. So don't. Think about something in your community or in your work where you can make a difference and concentrate on that. Maybe it's clearing litter to prevent it going into the rivers and ending up in the ocean. Get some friends to help you. You'll find that, gosh, you know, we are making a difference here. Then you want to make more difference and you'll inspire more people. And then, because, well, the Jane Goodall Institute is now in um, 26 countries. But the Roots and Shoots program is in close to 70 countries. And so then you know that, yes, I'm making a difference here. They're making a difference there and there and there. And there. That's much more hopeful. Dr. Jane, uh, when we talk about uh, artificial intelligence, some people have this kind of ap apocalyptic view. And some other people say, no, with technology, we can help preserve uh, the, the environment. And now, what's your opinion on that? Well, we can go either way. It's both. It's not one or the other. Um, you know, in some ways, the Jane Goodall Institute, we use technology. We use it for mapping. 
we use it for monitoring the progress, the um, position of the chimpanzees, the health of the forest, uh, camera traps, which are teaching us so much about shy animals that you don't normally see, this new auditory um, technology where we can identify the sounds of different animals, given us three new species to Gombe we didn't know about That's before. Great. So yes, we can use it for good, but we can also use it in very harmful, dangerous ways. One a little ago, you mentioned the point of no return. This seems to be something that scares everybody. Do you think we're close to the point of no return, or do you think there's a date that we can set up to say, no, from, if we don't do something from this date on, it's going to be a point of no return? Well, people say that. Right. Um, I don't see how we can predict a date. Right. I think we've got a window of time. I don't know how big it is. I don't think it's huge. And it's still closing. That's why, I mean, why else age almost 90 would I be rushing around the world in this ridiculous way? Because <laughs> it's not, I'm sure it's not too late, but it does require action. We thank you for this. <laughs> the planet thanks you. Uh, Dr. Jin, you also mentioned that hope is contagious. I, I want to know what you, what you mean by that. Well, if, if um, okay, you're feeling very depressed this morning. You're just feeling... It's too late. And then you meet somebody like me who says, no, it's not too late, but you have to make a difference. You've got to do something. Um, and then in the doing something, you feel more hopeful. So it, it, hope is contagious. That means other people around you will feel, oh, so well, he thinks there's hope. Then maybe there is. And yeah, but I must do my bit. This is great. Uh, you talk a lot about hope. I mean, you have the book of hope and all. Uh, you consider yourself an optimistic. Mm. Yeah, I'm optimistic. And you meet a lot of people that don't share this, this same point of view. I meet a lot. And, you know, very often after a lecture, they come up and they say, oh, you've changed me. I promise I'll do my bit. That's great. And um, I have one final question. Thank you so much. And uh, I have a daughter, she's 16 years old. What message would you have? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Brazilian children. <clears throat> Sorry. Sorry, how old is she? She's 16. 16. I, have a, I have a 16-year-old daughter, she, her name is Isabel. What message would you have for Brazilian children? Well, the message I have for Brazilian children and your daughter, uh, is that they're in this world for a reason. And she may not yet know what that reason is, but sometime it will come to her. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm supposed to do. And then the thing is to work it all out, roll up sleeves and take action. You know, that's, that's the message that I have. And I'll give you one last image. Humanity is at the mouth of a very, very long, very dark tunnel. And right at the end is a little star shining. That's hope. But it's no good sitting at the mouth of the tunnel and wondering when that star will come to us. We have to roll up our sleeves and crawl over, crawl under, climb over, work around all the obstacles that lie between us and the star, like climate change, loss of biodiversity, industrial agriculture, um, cruelty, hunting, um, mining for gold, all these terrible things that we're doing to the planet. And the good news, every single one of those problems has a group or several groups working to solve it. The sad thing is they so often work separately in silos. And what we need to do is join together. Because to give a simple example, if you solve one problem, if you're not thinking um, you know, holistically, you might not realize you're causing another. So just take, for example, hey, we shut down this coal mine. All those emissions aren't going up, all that CO2. But what about the people who've lost their jobs, who are then going to go and probably destroy the environment in order to survive? So we need to, we need to have connection between people working on all these different problems so that you solve the job problem before you create it. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thanks.